The CERN Particle Accelerator is a giant ring, 27 kilometers in circumference, buried 100 meters underground on the French-Swiss border. Two particle beams are circulated at high speed inside this ring. Analyses of the collision of these beams, captured by ultra-sensitive detectors, have helped pierce the mysteries of matter and the origin of the universe. We're here at the CMS detector, where the particles of the LHC collider come from both directions here, and they collide there in the middle and produce many collisions. You can compare this, more or less, with a digital camera. But in your digital camera, your sensor is about this size, whereas here you see it's a big volume, about 10 by 10 meters. And the further difference is that a camera typically takes 50 pictures per second, whereas here we take 40 million times per second a picture, which corresponds to producing 10,000 DVDs per second. Given this quantity, information must be selected. Electronic filters only let through data that is considered pertinent. Even so, the amount of data processed by the computing center is impressive. Initially, this data is stored on thousands of hard drives stored in computer racks. Scientists can therefore access the data they need for their research very quickly. Yet the amount of data is so large that it would take several decades to analyze them, even if CERN had a network of computers that could process millions of operations per second. Unlocking the secrets of matter in the universe takes time, a period of time that is much too long given the fragility of the hard drives on these servers. This is why the CERN IT engineers had to use another medium to ensure the long-term storage of their valuable data. The Large Hadron Collider data are stored here. Here means in these cartridges that contain tapes. Automated units like these fetch them when a physicist needs to re-examine or reanalyze data. There are more than 50,000 robot-managed tapes, which are used as archive media for all of the LHC data. Why tapes? In fact, I have been here at least 15 or 20 years, and the same question always comes up. Aren't we going to change the system? The answer is no. There are several reasons. First, recent analysis demonstrate that tapes are a thousand times more reliable than disks. Second, tapes, when they are not reused, don't consume any electricity. Third, if you drop a hard drive, there's a very good chance that it will be completely destroyed. That's not true of a tape. The plastic container could be damaged, but we would be able to retrieve the data. Proof of its reliability, the first computers made in the 1950s opted for tape. And since this pioneering era, the storage capacity of tapes has been constantly increasing. The storage capacity of tapes, as for disks, and the density of transistors on a processor is limited. Yet today, several manufacturers have proven, through lab tests, that tapes could achieve a capacity of 50 terabytes per cartridge. We are therefore at a factor of 10 from these theoretical limits. The quantity of information generated by the LHC may seem to be enormous, but it is just a drop of water in the sea of data that we produce on a planetary scale. Over a 24-hour period, 145 billion emails are sent, some 4.5 internet searches, 
Every day we generate 2.5 trillion bytes of data. These astronomical numbers are so hard to conceive that the computer sector had to invent its own scale based on the byte. A byte consists of eight bits, representing zeros or ones. Therefore, a single character of text corresponds to a byte. One page, three kilobytes. 300 pages, a megabyte. A library, a gigabyte. Five libraries, a DVD. Six million books, a terabyte, or a stack of 200 DVDs. A 200-meter stack of DVDs represents a petabyte. A one-kilometer high stack of DVDs, an exabyte, is the equivalent of all the information produced by humanity through 2003. A stack of DVDs stretching from the Earth to the Moon represents 1.8 zettabytes, or all the information produced in the year 2011. A stack of DVD linking Mars to the Sun represents a yottabyte, or the volume of digital data generated within the next five years. At first sight, no existing medium could store such a huge mass of data. Does this mean our societies are facing an impasse? Certainly not. Scientists responsible for storing data have understood that we now have to change our mindset. They are now looking at a device we all carry within us and that has already proved to be effective. This complex system, whose immense resources still hold many surprises, is DNA, contained in the chromosomes of all forms of life. Nick Goldman and his team are exploring this aspect of DNA at the European Bioinformatics Institute in the UK. There's lots of reasons why DNA is a good medium. It's very, very small. It's very inexpensive. It lasts a very long time. It doesn't require any energy. And we will always be able to read DNA. So something like a, a, a floppy disk is no longer readable. Uh, in a few years' time, probably DVDs will no longer be readable because we won't have the technology any longer to do that. But DNA, we will always have some technology to read DNA. The technology changes, and at the moment, it's changing very fast. Every couple of years, there's a new machine to read DNA. But because it's the, the stuff in our, in our own genomes, uh, we will always have a new machine that can read DNA. Nick Goldman's team decided to encode in DNA a photograph of their institute, a text on genetics, some Shakespearean sonnets, and an audio file of Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. In Alabama with its vicious racist. The challenge was to move from a computer language consisting of zeros and ones to a much more complex genetic code that involves not just two, but four components. The four DNA molecules symbolized by the letters A, C, T, G. These four elements came together at the bottom of the oceans millions of years ago to create the vocabulary of life. The famous DNA double helix is certainly the first code that ever existed on planet Earth. But with DNA, we have four letters that we can use. Uh, and it's like, a, it's like looking at Lego, where I have four colors of blocks. And I can put those together in any order to make a message. And we devised a code that would use different, uh, it's like colors, but letters of DNA. Uh, and each little block would represent one byte or one small part of the signal. And then we can put those together in any order to make the larger signal. And we devised a code that would do this, uh, but would minimize the number of errors that would happen uh, due to reading and writing DNA. 
Nick Goldman and his staff started with the zeros and ones encoding the photograph, texts, and the audio file. They then applied their mathematical code to switch from this binary language to the four letters ACTG, forming the DNA code. The photograph, texts, and speech were then fragmented into thousands of DNA segments. These were then reproduced chemically. At the end of the process, the original digital message is recorded on thousands of inert artificial DNA strands. Now the DNA holds the information in physical form. It looks like it's empty, but there's a tiny speck of DNA in there, and we sent that to the laboratories in Heidelberg to be read. At this point, genetics takes over from digital processing. To test the process, the strands were sent to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Germany to be decoded. Biologists place the DNA strands in sequencers. These instruments will read the combinations of the four letters ACTG. I mentioned the data which are produced in large research facilities like CERN or here at EMBL. Then you have to find a proper way to store it or at least to archive it in the first instance. Otherwise, all the scientific progress we are doing in the near future, we can't access it anymore. It starts already that our society is losing knowledge. And actually, I think that the research on DNA storage is one of the really promising fields in this area. Another advantage of DNA, it is a solid material that stands up perfectly to transport. To store DNA, you have to really consider three parameters. The first thing is to have to keep it cold, and you have to keep it dry, because this is preventing any chemical reactions around. The third thing is you should prevent it from light. It is therefore not surprising that the frozen dry ground of Siberia was perfect for conserving the DNA fragments of animals that had died thousands of years ago. About one year ago, a scientific paper was published studying the genomes of ancient horses, and they had samples of DNA that had lasted for 700,000 years, and they were able to successfully read back much of that DNA. So that's an experiment that has already been done that shows that DNA can last holding an information, holding a signal, for more than half a million years. It took the German team nearly two weeks to decode all the DNA sequences sent by the British Research Institute. All the DNA strands were read and all the messages were fully retrieved. After we received the sequence read information back from the Heidelberg Laboratory, we decode those fragments of DNA uh, and we put back together the binary files um, based on that information. And then we want to compare whether that exactly matches what we started with. So the photograph looks exactly the same. And we also checked uh, in the computer whether every single bit, every zero and one was correct, and it was.